Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India Hello friends, welcome back to this 19th lecture in the series on human behavior. This lecture will be dedicated to an interesting fact, an interesting variable which influences human behavior. Up till this point of time, we have looked at individual factors which affect human behavior and this lecture is going to follow and specify how people around us affect our behavior. So, the core of these lectures will be social influence and social cognition, how we think about other people, how other people think about us, what kind of interactions with, uh, we have with other people and how the presence or absence of other people lead us to change our behavior. Before we go into the details of the lecture as we have been doing throughout, let us take a quick trip down the memory lane and look at what we have done till now in this course on human behavior. We started off by looking at what is human behavior, how do we study it, why do we study it what is the need for studying human behavior. We looked at the science of psychology which helps in the study of human behavior. We looked at the origins of the science of psychology from both philosophy and physiology. We looked at schools of psychology, newer schools of psychology and various viewpoints or perspectives that psychology takes to look at individual behavior. We looked at several methodologies and techniques for studying human behavior. Then our journey was set into looking at how changes in the external environment is encoded into the psychological realm. The behavior is a result of change in a stimuli. So, we looked at how is this change of stimuli encoded in the psychological realm or is recognized by the brain. So, we look at sensory receptors and sensory systems, we looked at the dynamics of the systems, the characteristics of the systems in terms of its sensitivity and sensory coding, we looked at how the human brain separates signals from noises, the meaningful from the not so meaningful and then we took a model system which is the human eye and looked at how does the human eye perform all functions that a sensory system should perform. We looked at the process of perception which is assigning meaning to incoming stimulus which is encoded by the sensory system. We looked at the five integrated process of perception which is the idea of attention, localization, the idea of recognition, three basic processes and two constant processes or two constant systems which the brain uses for making meaning which is abstraction and constancy. Once something is organized and a meaning generated out of it, it has to be included into the already known database and that is the process of learning. So, when next we looked at what is learning, we looked at various forms of learning, classical conditioning, operant conditioning, observation learning, habituation, sensitization, different forms of learning various parameters, characteristics of learning and we saw how new information or new meaning which has been generated from the incoming stimuluses, how they are encoded into the already known representations, already known knowledge. 
Now, this knowledge has to be saved somewhere and that is where the idea of memory came in. So, we looked at what is memory, the two views of memory. We looked at how the human memory really works in terms of not only encoding, but storing and retrieving this information at a later point of time for ease of access, for ease of problem solving. We looked at the idea of long term memory and what kind of information are stored in long term memory. Once we are done with memory and once we have knowledge and stored somewhere, this knowledge has to be communicated between people and there we started looking at a process of language. Now, language and communication helps us exchanging ideas between people or expressing our ideas. So, we looked at a classical language system which is the English language, we looked at its basics, characteristics, operations and functions. Then we looked at thinking which is the language of the human mind, we looked at how does human thinking really work, we looked at two reasoning processes which is the divergent versus convergent reasoning, inductive and deductive reasoning and how these processes help us in thinking and making decisions. Further on we looked at the process of categorization and concept formation which is used for reasoning and thinking. We pushed the boundary a little further and looked at how our problems actually solve, everyday problems actually solve with the use of language and thinking. Once this was done, we started venturing into other processes or other factors which decide our behavior in situations. So, we looked at intelligence which is another factor which defines how humans behave in situations. We looked at the theories of intelligence, we looked at how intelligence is measured and we looked at what is the role of intelligence and genetics and environment on human behavior. Next we focus on something called it emotion, we looked at what is emotion and how does it affect human behavior. We looked at the various theories of emotion, contrasted these theories and then at the end of the lectures we looked at the standard model of emotion which is called the intelligence emotion or emotional intelligence and how this system changes our behavior or manipulates our behavior in various conditions. We also looked at creativity which is a part of this uh, emotion process and how creativity also helps us in this emotion process. Last two lectures are dedicated in studying what is personality which is a stable form of behaving. We looked at the definitions of personality and we looked at several theories of personality. The idea of Freud who believes that unconscious is the reason for people behaving or having certain kind of personalities. We looked at the humanistic theories which believe that the self or humans own perception of subjective evaluations lead to personality. We looked at the idea of how learning and conditioning shape personality and other theories of personality contrasted these theories and later on we looked at methodologies of studying personality. So, we focused on the questionnaire method, we focused on the projective method and we focused on the newer methods using biological systems for measuring personality. So, as I said up till now we have looked at various individual factors which shape human behavior, but there is a number of other factors other people factor I would call which also shape our behavior. So, how interacting with others shape our behavior or do other people matter to us? If they do, what do the people think about us and how does that matter for us? How does that shape our behavior? So, let us start with a small story. Remember the stories that I told you a while ago where I went to this reunion of our school. Now, I have a friend of mine, uh, we have been doing quite well after our uh, doctoral dissertation, we have been placed at good institutions and so both of us were in this party. And so, in uh, this party I met another common friend of ours. So, we, we were talking and then things were happening. It was good for me to uh, know so many people and see so many other people. Now, since both of us live nearby, 
while returning back from the party, I saw this friend of mine actually laughing out very loudly and I asked the reason why are you laughing that much. So, she says to me that do not you remember uh, this and this person, the lady you were talking to. I said yes, yes, I do remember this person from back from school. So, uh, my friend explains me that uh, I was talking to this other friend of ours and I was trying telling us how you have been through several places and uh, having several positions because joining before joining here I have had couple of other positions as well. And she was describing how she had had uh, I have had all these experiences across different positions in places around the world. And then finally, I got the position teaching position that I am presently in. So, the reason she explained for the laughing was that this common friend of ours tells her that oh, he seems to be quite intelligent, but then I did not knew that he could not keep a job because he had been moving quite a lot. The meaning of the story is that people perceive information differently, different people perceive information differently. And so, what we say to them and what they understand and behave that also defines our behavior. So, basically the laugh that this friend of mine was actually showing was she is trying to interpret how did this common friend of mine come up with the idea that I could not keep a job whereas she thought that I was a very good and quite an intelligent person. And I have been moving around because I, I did not get a full tenure position uh, anywhere and so when I got a tenure position I settled with it. So, how this information was interpreted by this common friend it was quite funny. So, basically other people interpret what information we give to them and they behave accordingly. Now, the science which looks at how we study others and how others study us is what is called social psychology and this is the basis of social influence and social cognition. So, let us start this uh, whole section on social cognition and uh, social influence. So, as I said other people are crucial part of our existence and play a key role in our happiness. It is not that just we alone can live in this world, it is people around us which provides us happiness, which provides us some meaning to uh, life that we live. And so, these people are crucial for existence, talking to them or living among them provides us the sense of being that we are. And so, every people around us play a larger role in who we are the society as such. Human beings are known to be social animals and so if we do not have people around us it would be very difficult to live or to live happily because other people or people around us are our support systems. So, social psychologists have a long specialized in the task of studying all aspects of social thought and social behavior. So, social psychology or social psychologists are those psychologists who study how people react to each other, how people influence each other and how social thought develops and how social behavior develops. Behavior is like altruism, behavior is like empathy, behavior is like compliance, behavior is like obedience or how we think about others, what others think about us, the notion of love, the notion of interpersonal attraction, all these things are social behavior. Social psychology studies any behavior that we do in relation to anybody outside of us. So, this notion or this idea that people around us are a crucial part of our everyday being is what is the subject matter for study of social psychologists. So, what we will do in this section is we will look at what is social thought which is how and what we think about others. So, not only we will look at what is social thought which is basically what kind of meanings that we provide to others, how we think and what we think about others and what kind of factors influence us. We will also see what is social behavior which is how we interact with other people. When interacting with people what kind of behaviors we show, what these behaviors are dependent on and how these behaviors influence us and others get influenced by us is also part of the study. We also look at something called social influence how others change our behavior. So, it is things like compliance, things like obedience, things like conformity which where other people 
change our behavior is also what we need to study. And then lastly, we will see something called attraction and love, why we like and dislike other people. So, all in all, this section is going to look at social factors, look at how behaviors and actions of people around us and our actions in turn influence the whole society or influence behaviors of both us and people around us. So, social thought, thinking about others, how do we think about others or what do we think about others? Let us say that you are in a supermarket, you are standing in a line and then you are buying your groceries. Now, suddenly and the line is quite big, say 5 or 6 people are behind you. Suddenly somebody appears running and cuts the line and comes before you and gives the products to this cashier for billing. What will you think about this person? Will you think that this person is inconsiderate, is stupid, arrogant that is cutting the line or this person has some real genuine need and so is cutting the line, maybe he is missing a bus, maybe he is missing a flight or some, some other reason or just simply that this person has not noticed you at all and so you maybe make a throat sound like <clears throat> to show your presence. So, how you behave in this situation, how you perceive others people's behavior and behave in this situation is what is social thought. How do you, what do you think about others and how do you think about others. So, one reason or one fact which helps us in understanding other people's behavior or thinking about others is called attribution which is understanding the cause behind other people's behavior. So, what is attribution? It is the reason that we provide to other people's behavior. So, the process through which we attempt to determine the cause behind others behavior is known as attribution. Attribution is the science or the process through which we try and understand the behaviors of others. Let us say somebody is walking on the road and he falls, we immediately assign a reason to it. Now, this assigning reason is important because the human brain always wants to assign reason to all events and so attribution is that science which is used for assigning this kind of reasoning, for giving this kind of reasoning, for making sense of other people's behavior. Now, attribution is an orderly process, generally assigning reasoning or giving reasons why people do what they do follows an orderly process. Attribution follows a certain order of events and certain order of facts and through that we come to know about other people's behavior, come to know about why other people did what they did. So, attribution is an orderly process where we examine others behavior for clues as to the causes behind what they say and do and then reach our decisions. So, in attribution what we tend to do, we look at others behaviors and then try and finding clues or evidences which may suggest some kind of reasoning of why a person does what it does. Somebody fell on the road, we look at the behavior of this person while he is falling and while he gets up and from whatever he says or does after that, even before that, that will give us some kind of a meaning of why this person fell, what is the reason that this person actually fell. Now, we generally consider basic information like whether other actions stem from internal causes straight or from external causes luck. What we tend to do is in this orderly process, what we tend to do is we look at the basic information, we tend to consider basic information of why this action has happened, why somebody has fall, uh, fallen and we try to know or try to understand, try to give meaning to the fact that whether the fall that this person has received is because he has an internal trait of falling, he is an accident prone person, wherever he goes he falls, he is a stupid person, he is not so observant person and so he does not look at all. So, whether it comes from that or from external causes, for example, he fell because of luck. So, focusing ourselves or considering this basic information for defining other people's behavior whether the behavior has occurred due to internal causes or external causes is what is attribution. So, while doing attribution, 
while providing reasoning to people's behavior, we generally focus on three things. First, consensus, the first kind of fact or first kind of factor that we look at while describing other people's behavior is called consensus. And what is consensus? Whether other people behave in similar ways as the person we are considering. So, if somebody falls on a road, we are looking for a distance, we would like to look at consensus, meaning that if this person has fallen, whether other people who have come through that route or through that point has fallen or not. So, whether other people behave in a similar fashion or fall from that point or fall at that point which we are considering. We look at consistency, whether this person behaves in the same manner over time, whether this person keeps on falling, whether he is an accident prone person or not. So, for finding out the reason whether the falling has happened because of an internal trait, where, meaning that this is an accident prone person or the idea that it has fallen because certain luck or certain bad weather has made him fall. For finding out the cause for that, we look at three things. The first is consensus, whether other people have fallen in that place or not, they behave in a similar manner. Second, whether this person over a period of time falls or not. And the third is something called distinctiveness, which is whether this person behaves in the same way in different situations, whether across situations, whether across different uh, if this is a road, then it uh, may be an escalator, may be in a train, whether this falls, person falls or not. And depending on the consensus, consistency and distinctiveness, we try to predict the behavior of this person or try to predict whether the behavior that this person has done comes from his internal causes or external causes. If the consistency is high and distinctiveness is low, we believe that it is an internal cause. But if consistency is high, and distinctiveness is also high, we believe that external causes are responsible for the behavior. So, high consistency in high distinctiveness will lead to an external source of a particular behavior, but a low in distinctiveness and a high inconsistency in consciousness will actually say that a person does this behavior over again and so it is the internal cause for this behavior. Now, of course, as we give meaning to other people's behavior or provide reasoning to other people's behavior, we are prone to a number of biases. Any kind of reasoning process, any kind of process where we try to assign meaning or give reasoning to people's act are prone to certain kind of errors because human beings are signal processing machines and signal processing machines are never accurate. So, they are prone to a number of errors and so what we are going to look now is into a number of errors, attribution errors which can arise. One of the error is something called the correspondence bias. Now, the first kind of attribution error or the error in assigning the reason behind why people do what they do is the correspondence bias. What is the correspondence bias? Let us look at a situation. You are standing or you are sitting in your office and suddenly you see your, fr your friend who comes in, as he comes in, he drops his file and then he slips, drops his briefcase, his lenses fall, he is flat on the floor and while falling he had caught a, let us say another folder which is kept on the desk which also falls, a glass which was kept on somewhere else also falls and water spills all over. What do you think in a situation like this? What would you say has happened? What is the reason that you provide to this kind of an act? Obviously, most people, if you are like most people, you will believe that this person is an accident prone person, nothing to do with the situation, right? You believe that this person is all lazy, he is all worked up and he is basically an unorderly person. Why cannot it be true that this, when this person came, comes in, it was snow on his shoes which made him fall. As he fell, he was holding file which was made up of flimsy material which fell out of his hand and actually fell. The glass was kept at the edge of the desk and so while falling down his hand hits the edge and the glass which is obviously at the edge falls down with him. So, why could it not be the situational bias and this kind of reasoning that we provide to people's behavior is what is called the correspondence bias. So, what is correspondence bias then? Correspondence bias relates to overestimating the role of dispositional cues. 
when we overestimate disposition or people's inherent trait to be like something, when we believe that internal causes or people's internal traits, people's internal characteristics are responsible for their behavior and when we tend to give this internal trait more value for any kind of behavior and which other people do, then we tend to fall into the trap of correspondence bias and what is this? Now, our strong tendency to explain others action corresponding to or stemming from dispositional or internal causes even in the presence of clear situational external causes and is called the correspondence bias. So, when it is very clear to us that external causes are present and they can very well explain the behavior of a person, but then we choose not to look at external situations, we choose to look at internal dispositional factors. The fact that this person is very unorderly, this person is very shabby, accident prone and that is the reason he falls. We do not look at the reason that he is coming out from snow and so his foot is all slippery, the glass was kept at the wrong place, the file was all slippery, the folder which was kept on the desk was also at the edge and, and near to falling. When we do not consider these reasons and consider the only reason that this person is shabby and is unorderly and he is uh, not likable and so on and so forth and accident prone and that reason being the reason for his falling, we are prone to be doing something called the correspondence bias. So, when we look at or try to focus more of dispositional factors, internal factors for any behavior and focus less on the situational factors, we tend to go into something called the correspondence bias. Now, why does this bias occur? Why does this bias happen at the first place? Others actions reflect their underlying characteristics. We start with the idea that when somebody does something, it is basically their dispositional trait, it is the underlying characteristics. We believe that whenever somebody does something, whenever an action is done by other people, it is their trait, it is their inherent position, it is what they learn, it is how they actually behave, which is the reason for whatever they are doing. Somebody steals something and we witness this, we believe that the idea that he is prone to stealing, he has that dispositional trait of stealing and that is why he is stealing. We never think about any other reason for that matter. We then correct for any possible effect for the external world by taking into account these characteristics. So, even if situational things are there, even if we see that this person is hungry, so uh, example where this small child steals food. Now, we can very clearly see that this small child is wearing all shabby clothes, is all rugged clothes and it is torn, he has no money, he has uh, hairs which are all over the place, so unkept hairs, long fingernails and it is very clear that this person is a beggar, he does not have food to live, he lives on the street. Now, despite the situational causes, when we look at this person stealing food from a shop and we undermine these situational causes and believe that this person, this boy who was stealing, is stealing because he likes stealing is what is the correspondence bias and that is how we actually look at correspondence bias. Now, we do not make enough allowance for the impact of external factors. So, given the fact that enough external factors are there and we do not make allowances for these external factors is how we look at or how we produce the correspondence bias. Another kind of bias which is prevalent is called the self-serving bias and what is the self-serving bias? Let us start with another story. Let us say your professor asks you to write an exam. So, you wrote an exam and then you expected a C and you got an A. What do you think? How would you think? You think that the paper was not easy, but it is your intelligence which has given you A. When you expected a C and you got an A, it is all you, but when you expected an A and you get a C, it is the situation and so that kind of bias or that kind of thinking is what is called the self-serving bias. So, what is it? It is the tendency to take credit for positive behaviors or outcomes by attributing them to internal causes, but to blame negative ones on external causes beyond our control. So, in the same example, when you get a good marks, you expected a C of an, of an exam and suddenly you get an A, 
you will believe that it, it is your intelligence, inherent intelligence which actually make you get A. You are better than most people, you studied very hard, you spend long hours of studying and that is the reason that you get A. And you will never consider the fact that the paper was easy or that by luck that year the professor somehow set very low standards for checking and so you got an A. But for the same exam, when you are expecting a B and you get a D, it is all about situations. You will believe that you were intelligent, but the paper was too hard. Maybe somebody next to you was disturbing you while writing the exam. Maybe the professor has been too strict and that is why you have gotten D. You were all good, but it is all the situation, all situational factors, all factors beyond of you which has made you get a D. And so, this kind of thinking where successes lead to internal factors and failures lead to external factors is what is called the self serving bias. It motivates people in certain way and that is why it is called the self serving bias. It serves you in a, your inner self, it helps your inner self in a certain way and that is why this is called the self serving bias. Now, let us look at why does it occur. Now, the bias stems from certain tendencies in the way we process social information. So, this bias comes generally from our tendencies to process different kind of social information. This happens as we expect to succeed and have a tendency to attribute expected outcomes to internal more than external causes. What it says is that when we succeed and when our expectations of success is very high, our tendency to attributing these successes or expected outcomes to our internal traits, to our internal ability, to our internal factors more than external factors is one reason why this bias really happens. It is always believed that when you have, when you know that certain expectations are there, you appear for an interview and then you believe that the interview will be good and it turns out to be good, it is always you which has made the interview good. But then when you believe the interview is going to be bad and it actually goes bad, you will not hold yourself responsible. Although you know that the out, you have predicted the outcome to be bad, you will always blame some other factor, maybe the environment, maybe the questions that were asked, maybe the person who is asking the question, maybe the kind of questions that were asked, every kind of information, any kind of factor other than you, that kind of the reason for this kind of bias. Now, self-serving bias, it stems from our needs to protect or enhance our self-esteem or related desire to look good in front of others. So, why does this bias happens? This bias happens or this kind of reasoning and thinking happens because one needs to protect and enhance its self-esteem. Self-esteem is our own value in our own eyes, is the value of our self in our eyes. And so, when we attribute good reasons or when things turn out to be good and we give our internal factors to that reason, we start valuing ourselves more. And so, one reason why we tend to relate our internal reasons for good outcomes or a good expected outcomes leads us to having high trust in ourselves, and that leading further to our self esteem that leading to valuing us more. Another reason is that since we want to look good in front of other people, we tend to assign positive outcomes to us and negative outcomes to situations because once we say the positive outcomes is related to us, others will feel good about us. They will think that we are really intelligent people. But if we assign bad outcomes to situations, then people will not blame us for any reason. They will not lesser our self esteem. They might think or they start thinking that it is the situation which will make the out negative outcome. And so, this various ways or this idea of boosting our self esteem or looking good in front of others is one of the possible reasons of the self-serving bias. Now, for the self-serving bias, both the cognitive and motivational factors may well play a role in this kind of attributional error. Cognitive factors is the kind of thinking that we have and the motivational factor is those factors which make us enhance our self-esteem, what motivations we have. Now, is self-serving bias a universal tendency occurring in all cultures? Now, the question is whether this self-serving bias is basically a universal tendency which occurs across different cultures, whether all cultures have the self-serving bias. And the answer to that lies in the fact that this bias is more common 
in individualistic societies which emphasizes individuals accomplishments than in collectivist societies which emphasizes outcomes of the group and the group harmony. Now, cultures which are individualistic like the western cultures, the western countries like America, Europe, Latin America, Canada, these countries are individualistic. These countries actually focus on the individual, here individuals are the core of the society and individual accomplishments, what a person does is more meaningful than what a group does, than what his family does. And so, in these cultures where person is held responsible or a person is responsible for his own actions, person accomplishments make who a person is. In those cultures, it is the self-serving bias which actually helps them have a good self-esteem and look good in front of others. But in individualistic cultures, where anybody's success is related to the whole people. Now, if you give an exam in the United States, SAT for example, and turn out with flying colors, it is you who has the ability and it is your success. But when in India, we pass a JE or any other competitive exam, it is the whole family which gets the proud. Everybody is proud of you. Everybody has their own share to it. And so, collectivist cultures actually look at everybody's role in your success. And so, in, the, in these cultures, self-serving bias is a little bit low. But in cultures where your accomplishments, your gains or your achievements are only because of you, in those cultures, self-serving bias has more role to play. And so, where, uh, the eastern cultures like Japan, like Asian cultures of India and Sri Lanka or maybe uh, many other South Asian or Asian countries, here where the collectivist country, where the accomplishments and achievements are shared by everyone in the family and near family or friends, there this self-serving bias is a little bit low or at the lower side. Now, social cognition. What is social cognition? How do we process social information? How do we process information about others? In social thought, we focus on how do we think about others. In social cognition, what we look at is what kind of information, what kind of processing of information do we acquire in processing information about others. So, let us take a story. A while back, there was an interview about this famous film star, porn star which is Sally Leon and she was telling about her story. Now, I was listening to this interview and we all have some notions about her and so I was all about whatever she said, it was all falling in line. I believe that she is a pompous lady, she is more about fashions, about the film world and so on and so forth. So, whatever she was saying was what most filmy people say. We all have characteristics, we know that what filmy people can go to, what kind of level of expression that they have, what kind of thoughts they have and so on and so forth. Until the point that suddenly she said that from the time that she had uh, adopted these children from India and some of the other Asian countries with her uh, husband Daniel Weber, she now focused not more on money and fame, but she focused on personal development and that dropped my jaw. How can that be true? This person who is all about money, this person is all about fame, how can she say a statement like that? And so, this is where the inconsistency is. Whenever an inconsistent information comes about some person about whom we have a particular kind of a frame set, how do we process that information is what is called social cognition. So, how we process information about others is what is social cognition. Now, identifying the cause behind others behavior is an important aspect of social thought, which is attribution. Social cognition involves deciding what information is the most important and so worthy of our attention. Social information or social cognition looks at how do we process several bits of information about other people, so that we can start thinking about them, so that we can find out the reason behind their behaviors, behind these people's behavior. Now, we must then be able to store and retrieve this information from long term memory. So, social cognition not only requires you to consider important information about other people, it also requires that you should be able to store and retrieve this information from long term memory at appropriate times. So, it is not only information about other people, relevant information about other people 
and how we process it is important. What is also important is how this information is stored and where it is stored and when needed at a future point of time, how do you retrieve that information. We must also be able to manipulate this information to make judgments about people and predict their future actions. So, not only should be able to focus on what information to look at to describe people's actions and causes behind people's behavior, we should also be able to save it and retrieve it when appropriate time comes. So, that we can take this information, mold it the way we want and are able to explain the reason behind other people's information. So, not only looking at information, storing that information, retrieving that information, but also using that information to predict people's behavior is what is called social cognition. Now, these tasks helps us in making sense of the social world. Why do we do it? Because by doing all this process of looking at important information, storing them, retrieving them, using them and making sense of other behavior actually helps us understanding the social world. And as I said, why is the understanding of social world important? The understanding of social world is important because people around us have a lot to offer for us. We have a lot to learn from them and we interact with them. So, they are our central interactions. They are very important in our life. So, dealing with inconsistent information, paying attention to what does not fit. So, how do we deal with an inconsistent information? I just said you that this interview about Sunny Leon was coming and she said something inconsistent and that dropped my jaw. So, how do I dealt with this information? How do people deal with inconsistent information which comes their way about people whom they are interacting? What we tend to do is pay much more attention to information that is unexpected or somehow inconsistent with our expectations than to information that is expected or consistent. Whenever we look at other people or the reason behind other people's information, we try to dig up those information, we focus on those information which supports our view or our causes behind other people's behavior. Information which goes contrary to our manifestations of other people, to our projections about other people are narrowed down or blocked down and that is what is the idea of social cognition. Now, the above tendency seems to stem from the fact that we work harder to understand inconsistent information because it is expected and surprising. Whenever an inconsistent information comes about a person, we all have models about other people, how this person is, how this person behaves, what kind of action this person does, what kind of reasoning this person does and so on and so forth. And so, if some inconsistent behavior comes in or inconsistent uh, fact comes in, this fact is unexpected and surprising and so we should mold it in a such a way that it fits our model of this person. This in turn leads to higher memories for such information which later influences our judgment. And so, because this information is novel, this information is stored in memory for future use where we use this information for making judgments about other people. The optimistic bias for task completion, we think we can do more sooner than we really can. There is another kind of bias in social cognition which is called the optimistic bias. Now, my neighbors some 10 to 11 years back, they were remolding their house and so what happened is that they thought that during the summer they would be able to do it for so 3-4 months, that is what the maximum it will take and so the remodel would take 4 months. They kept on push, pumping money into it and it kept on happening. So, they employed a contractor which promised who actually promised them that they will finish the work in 3 months and then 3 months turned out to be 6 months and then 8 months and 10 months and so on. So, but still it is still lying in the way it is. A lot of work has been done, but it is not so complete. Now, this basic premise or this basic bias where we are optimistic or where we jump the gun, make optimistic biases about our work or about certain tasks is what is called the optimistic bias for task completion. Now, in predicting how long a given task will take, people's tendency turns out to be overly optimistic. If you are asked this question, when you are doing a job, let us say you are doing a maths homework. Now, when I ask you how long it is going to take, you would be optimistic about it and you tend to give me lesser time than it actually takes. And this bias of judging lesser time or thinking of lesser time for a task to complete than it actually does 
is what is called the optimistic bias. Now, they predict that they can get the job done much sooner than actually turns out to be the case. This tendency is called the planning fallacy and this is basically what is called the planning fallacy. Planning fallacy is a fallacy where we tend to plan things. Whenever we plan things, we tend to plan it in an optimistic way. We do not look at other problems which are coming our way. Even if we look at our problems, we tend to give lesser time to facts. And then when originally when the task actually goes through, then it takes more time. Last last week, I was reinstalling my PC and installing a in, uh, new operating system which was Linux. Now, by my fixations, it would take a day and a half for doing it. But when I started doing it, I planned things according to it. When I started doing it, it took more than a weekend. It took at least four days for doing this task. And so, basically, this was what the planning fallacy was. So, it took more than four and a half days to install an operating system. Why? Because I had done these predictions, I had been optimistic in how quickly I can do something, but things do not turn up to be the way it is. The would, problems would arise and so this task would be or task that you plan to complete would go back or the deadline would shift and that is what is the optimistic bias. What leads to this kind of a common error? What leads to uh, this planning fallacy? Now, individuals predicting a task completion enter into a planning mode of thought and focus primarily on how they will perform a task in future. When we are in a planning fallacy, when we are planning a task, we enter into something called a planning mode. And in the planning mode, we think about future events, we think about future tasks and we start planning in such a way that this task will take this much time, this task will this take this much time. So, we tend to go into this mode where we enter into a future mode. What we tend to forget is that we do not focus on how these tasks or similar tasks, how much time they took while we are performing this in past. So, we do not look at past experiences or our past experiences with this task. We just jump into a future mode of how long this is going to that and that basically is one of the reason for entering into this kind of a fallacy or entering into the optimistic bias. Another factor which play an important role in planning fallacy is motivation to complete the task. Now, once we start a task, we are very highly motivated to do it. As we progress and as more and more problems come in, the motivation goes down. So, when I started formatting my system or installing Linux into it, I was all happy about it, all motivated about it. Soon I found out that somehow the usual legacy thing or the UFBI or the legacy mode it is, as it is called of installation, secure versus legacy mode. So, I have to opt between that and so that led me took another 2 or 3 hours to solve that problem. Once the system was installed at the time of installation, there are certain files which were missing because the CD would, was not written properly and so I had to install those files and the dependency comes in and so things happen slower, slower a number of problems came in. Initially, we was all motivated to do this task very high motivation. As, as days progress, my motivation became slowly, slowly it went away. And by the end of the four, uh, five days period, it was all about just install it somehow or maybe not install it at all. And so, that is another reason for this kind of a bias. If one rule planning fallacy is this motivation. Now, when predicting that what will happen in future, individuals often guess that that will happen and is what they want to happen. When predicting what features, we tend to predict that certain things are going to happen in future, this is how it is going to be. But then unfortunately, it does not happen that way and then we turn onto this kind of a bias which is called the planning fallacy or planning bias. Another interesting thing to look at in social cognition is something called the contrafactual thinking, the effects of considering what might have been. Now, remember the example that I gave, you took a test, you are expecting a A, you got a C, what happens next? You start thinking about all those times or all those that would have happened if you have got a B or a A. If I would have done this, then I would have gotten A. If I would have done this, I would have gotten B. If I would have gotten A, this would have happened, this would have happened and this kind of thinking is called contrafactual thinking. Let us take another example. In the newspaper, I read that uh, there is an old building in my town and so a woman was wa walking through that, that particular part of the town. The building fell and bricks hit this woman and actually this woman got hurt. Will you be sympathetic for this woman? Yes, you would be. Now, two further evidences that this newspaper provided. Let us say that these are the information. 
that the newspaper provided. In what bit of information the newspaper suggests that this woman was a stranger in town, she has not been in this part of the town, she never saw the building falling and now the building falls and she got hurt. In the other case, the in information provided is that this woman who actually got hurt worked in a building next to the building, she was aware of the building's status, still she walked by the building, it fell on her and she got hurt. In which case are you supposed to be or will you be more sympathetic? Of course, in the first case where you believe that this woman is a stranger never knew about the building and she came down the building or under the building the rocks fell on her, stones fell on her or bricks fell on her and she got hurt. So, the sympathy in the first case will be higher than the other. Why? Contrafactual thinking. The idea is that when this woman has been passing this building again and again, we start thinking that she might have noticed, she would have noticed this building again and again and then that would have prevented her from going there, but still she went there and so that is the reason that the bricks fell on her and she actually uh, got hurt. But in other case, this person, there is no contrafactual thinking to start with and that is one of the things. So, what is contrafactual thinking? Contrafactual thinking are thoughts about what might have been are known in social psychology as contrafactual thinking. So, thoughts about if this would have happened, that would have happened, if I would have passed, I would have got this, if I would have got an A, I would have got a bicycle, if I would have been a scientist, I would have done this research or that kind of thinking where what would have been leads to what it could be is what is contrafactual thinking and it occurs in a wide range of situations including disappointments. Generally, this kind of contrafactual thinking happens in mostly in disappointments. When you do not succeed in a task, you start thinking about all those ways that you would have done, all those corrections that you have done which led you to or which would have led you to doing something good or led you to doing something di thing differently so that you would have succeeded and that basically is what is called contrafactual thinking. So, contrafactual thinking is not only apparent in disappointments because in disappointments contrafactual thinking is most apparent, it is also apparent in other cases as well. Now, engaging in this contrafactual thinking can produce a number of effects, a number of effects, a number of outcomes can come from contrafactual thinking. First, such thinking can either boost or depress the current mood. When you start thinking about events that would have been which would have led to some other kind of an outcome that would either boost or depress your mood. If you think about better outcomes that will boost your mood in some way, but if you think about worse outcomes the behavior or your mood would have shifted in some other way. And so, positive outcomes would actually enhance your mood, would boost your mood and depressing outcomes or disappointments would actually would lead to poorer moods by counterfactual thinking. Now, if individuals imagine better outcomes than actually occurred, they may experience regret, envy or dissatisfaction especially if they do not feel capable of obtaining better outcomes in future. So, individual examining better outcomes than actually occurring, they actually express regret. So, if they thought that something good would have happened and this good does not happen, they experience something called regret or dissatisfaction or envy. And when does this happen? When they believe that they are not capable of obtaining better outcomes in future. So, if you know that this is the best attempt and you cannot do better than this and still you would have failed, what you tend to experience is regret generally the idea of experience of regret, the experience of disappointments. If you know, somehow know that you can do better in future, then this regret is lowered down. But if you know that this is your best shot and you cannot have a better shot than this, then the type of this uh, feeling that you have once you fail or once you get negative outcomes is the dissatisfaction or envy or disappointments and regret. Counterfactual thinking can also help individuals understand in why negative outcomes occur. One of the most important thing in counterfactual thinking is to look at something called reasons behind negative outcomes. Once you do counterfactual thinking, once you start thinking about why something would have happened or how something would have happened, if you would have done things differently, if A would have changed, if some factors would have changed, what kind of results would have happened or why you did not succeed in something and why you succeeded in other things or why you succeeded in all of the things or none of the things. This leads you to finding out reasons why the negative outcome or positive outcome have happened. Generally, people do not focus on positive outcome, so they focus on negative outcome. So, when you in detail analyze 
why the negative outcome has occurred. You come to know about several factors, several reasons why the negative outcome has happened and when that comes in place or that is there, these reasons are there, these reasons can be further evaluated to look at the reasons behind the negative outcome which could actually help a person then manipulate or change these reasons so that they get better outcomes in next trial. So, counterfactual thinking is not disappointed thinking, not a kind of bias, not a kind of problem, but at times counterfactual thinking can not only enhance your mood, but it can also lead to you knowing the things that you have done wrong and what you can do in future or how you can tackle a problem in future so that it can give you success. So, what we did in today's lecture is we looked at two important parts of social cognition, social influence, how other people around us and we in turn influence others behavior. We started off by looking at what is social psychology and what is the subject matter of social psychology and then we focused on something called social thought. How do we think about people's behavior? We looked at attribution, the reasons for attribution, the correspondence bias which is putting too much effort into explaining situational internal causes for people's behavior, the self-serving bias where positives about us are always us, internal factors and negatives about us is always the external sources. We looked at the idea of social cognition, we looked at several kind of biases in social cognition. For example, we looked at what is counterfactual thinking, we looked at how the optimistic bias works how we tend to be optimistic at times and not only be optimistic at times and this can lead to planning fallacies. We looked at how we looked at inconsistent information and deal with inconsistent information or manipulate inconsistent information so that it fits our description of people. And we looked at those different kind of biases and how consensus, consistency and distinctiveness actually help us in predicting what people's behavior. When we meet next, we will move ahead of here and then look at social influences, we will look at what are attitudes and prejudices and we will also look at the concept of interpersonal attraction and love. We will look how these processes shape our behavior and shape human behavior and what is the percentage of role that these kind of acts of be it attitude, be it prejudice, be it stereotype, be it the self-serving bias, be it any kind of attributional process or the idea of uh, compassionate versus passionate love, how uh, getting in and out of love and all these factors actually design our behavior or influence our behavior and our acts, our responses to stimuli. But that happens in the next uh, lecture and till we meet again in the next lecture, it is bye from here. Thank you.